The label Christian nationalism is often heard in media and political circles. In this election year, you're going to hear a lot about this. Depending on the source, attempts to define the term painted as more ominous than ever before. Well, CBN's chief political analyst, David Brody, brings us the story. Since Donald Trump's entry into politics began with a ride down the Trump Tower escalator almost nine years ago, the presidential candidate spoke directly to evangelical Christians, and many responded in kind. In 2024, not much has changed. We have to bring back our religion. We have to bring back Christianity in this country. Unfortunately, some who made their way inside the Capitol on January 6th echoed some of that same spirit. Let's all say a prayer. In the aftermath of those events, many news organizations took a closer look, resulting in stories such as the growing danger of Christian nationalism that's rooted in political power and even violence. Georgetown professor Paul Miller wrote the book, What's Wrong with Christian Nationalism? There's a kind of nationalism that uses Christian language and symbols and rhetoric to advance its agenda. And, 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 and it's bad. I think Christian nationalism is real. But what is being included under the umbrella term Christian nationalism? And how widespread is it really? A new Public Religion Research Institute poll shows roughly 3 in 10 Americans qualify as Christian nationalist adherents or sympathizers. But in that specific survey, the criteria cite someone as a Christian nationalist if they believe the following, that the government should declare America a Christian nation, laws should be based on Christian values, that we will not have a country anymore if America moves away from our Christian foundations, being Christian is an important part of being truly American, and that God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. Well, that grouping could potentially include millions of Bible-believing, church-going Christians who don't view many or some of those concepts as radical at all. Russ Vogt is the president of the Center for Renewing America, an organization devoted to restoring and promoting Judeo-Christian principles. Their definition of Christian nationalism is something that obviously we reject. I mean, they're 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 putting this in in, in a bucket that is, is un-American. We're not talking about theocracy. A recent Politico article painted Vote and the group as an organization developing plans to infuse Christian nationalist ideas in a new Trump administration. Vote sees that as a scare tactic. We're a think tank. We have a policy uh, bent towards us. We have goals that are one year, five year, 25, 50 year aims. And I would put Christian nationalism and, and really the desire for Christian nationism in that bucket. Vote says it's about preserving a Judeo Christian heritage through sound public policy decisions. I do believe in a, that America has been, should be, and I hope it to be someday a Christian nation that affords religious liberty to everyone. Miller and others see it differently. They feel Christian nationalists are more about pursuing special rights for Christians and not religious liberty at all. A good litmus test here is, um, you know, do you support the same freedoms and rights for non-Christians? In one statistical litmus test, Pew Research shows that less than 1% of white evangelical Protestants actually believe Christians should get special rights. And of those who believe that the U.S. should be a Christian nation, only 24 percent think the federal government should advocate Christian religious values. About twice as many, 52 percent, believe the government should advocate for moral values that are shared by people of many faiths. Meanwhile, others have used the Christian nationalist label for those who hold the following view. They believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. While those remarks receive criticism from conservative evangelicals, Professor Miller believes it comes down to a question of where does American identity come from? Universal values or Christian ones? If you think that, we should privilege uh, the Judeo-Christian template in the public square. That's Christian nationalism. Are you out to advocate for Christian principles or Christian power? Russ Vogt says what this is truly about is politics and creating a narrative that anything labeled as Christian nationalism is dangerous with the goal of keeping conservative Bible-believing Christians out of the public square 
and public policy. The continental divide between right and left is about God. Do you believe that God is the measure of all things, or do you believe that man is the measure of all things? And that really, if you kind of understand that fundamental, it's going to help interpret where you see people not fall not only on this debate, but on a host of, of, of public policy debates. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Watch out for this term because I think this is going to be used as, as a wedge term to drive politics. I've said for years that if you are an evangelical, you're a Protestant who believes in life, you're pro-life, and you're a qualified lawyer, there, there's no way you'll make it through the U.S. Senate to get on the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and the history backs me up on this. Um, it, it seems to be, regardless if you're white or black, if you're evangelical, Protestant, and heaven forbid you're charismatic, uh, then you can't make it through a, a Senate confirmation hearing. Um, you know, John Ashcroft is a notable exception. To, he made it to attorney general. But you, you look at the, it's, it's obvious discrimination. And there's fear mongering here. Uh, that somehow or other we're trying to uh, turn, Christians are trying to turn America into a theocracy. Nothing could be further from the truth. I, I know the history. I, I know what the founding fathers went through. And they had very much Oliver Cromwell on their mind when they were creating the Constitution. Uh, if you don't know English history, it was a, um, a Puritan movement to take over the government and get rid of the king. And it absolutely failed because Cromwell became another king. It, it didn't work. Theocracies don't work. I believe in a secular, democratic republic. Democracies are, can become unhinged. Republics always turn into aristocracy. Aristocracy, monarchy, and no way to govern. But you have these checks and balances, and it, it's all designed for liberty that you have freedom of religion, you have freedom of speech, you have freedom of conscience. There isn't any religious test for public office in our country. We need to stand up for these ideas and in standing up, recognize and call it for what it is, that it's religious discrimination. You are trying to paint an entire group of American Americans as somehow unfit for office or unfit for the public square. Please be aware of this. That's the agenda. That's what's uh, trying to happen. Now, at the end of the day, I'm a Christian. I believe that if a culture, if a society comes together and says, can we observe these two rules? Can we love God with all our heart, everything within us? Can we love him? And can we love our neighbor as ourselves? That if we truly followed that, we would have a wonderful society. You'd have a wonderful neighborhood. You'd have a wonderful country. It would be wonderful to do that. Can you force that? Absolutely not. Can you legislate that? I don't think you can legislate love. But if you convince people, if you keep preaching, this is a good way to go. This is a good way to, to have life and have it more abundantly. Well, then you'll have great success. And that's what has built America. It's not forced on anyone. You have the right to choose. And I hope that we as Americans will choose and choose to do life and life more abundantly.